There are many hellish and monstrous creatures who plague the old world and beyond. The hated green-skinned hordes who live for naught but war. The dark and murderous vampires that toil in the night against the living. The filthy dark elves that struggle and strive to dominate the globe. And even the foul spawn of chaos. But there is an ever-present threat in the darkness of the underpasses that seeks to destroy all order and reason. Few are those who know the silent, lurking menace that lies just below the surface. They are waiting, biding their time, scheming plots that extend unseen across the lands, an evil threat which lurks in the poisonous shadows. And there are those who are feared, hated, and reviled even within the Under Empire, the ruthless assassins and unparalleled skill of those Skaven belonging to Clan Eshin. For the right price, these black-clad killers are capable of slaying any rival, steal any piece of information, infiltrate any fortress, and commit any act of sabotage as required. I feel the eyes upon me wherever I go. I cannot shake the notion that I am being followed. As I lay in my bed at night, I can hear the sound of claws upon the tiles of my roof. It is as if, if everything I do, every word I speak, is being marked. Before we continue exploring the lore of the great Skaven clans, we'd like to thank Warhammer Chaos in Conquest for sponsoring this video. Immerse yourself in the classic lore of Warhammer fantasy battles and join thousands of other players around the world by downloading the game on any mobile device. Conquer the war for the old world, claim the throne and become the ever-chosen of chaos. In the game, you will find more than 30 demons and warriors of chaos for you to command and even upgrade. Slay enemies and make strategic alliances to protect your citadel, speed up your constructions, and receive additional benefits. Engage in the realm of endless battles and feel the taste of the real-time strategy MMO experience set in Warhammer Fantasy. It is the ultimate strategy and domination MMO mobile game. Available on iOS and Android. Download it by clicking on the link in the description or by scanning the QR code now and claim special rewards. Men, elves, and dwarves alike tremble with disgust and fear at the thought of the vile and hated Skaven, the children of the horned rat who embody all that is vile and despicable, a race that have extended through the ages to every kingdom above and below ground. Their numbers are endless, as is the number of the clans that form the Skaven society, if it can even be called that. Amongst the four greatest Skaven clans, the warriors of Clan Eshin are particularly shadowy and mysterious. They have eyes and ears in every corner of the Under Empire in secret places of the surface cities and settlements. Most suspicious deaths and acts of espionage in Skaven society are blamed on the nefarious Clan Eshin. Such accusations are probably true, but, of course, there is no evidence. Led by the ancient night lord Visktrin, the clan vanished into the Far East, leaving the other Skaven clans left behind to wonder and speculate for centuries of their whereabouts. Many even forgot about their existence. However, after hundreds of years, the mysterious clan returned to Skavenblight from the distant lands of Nippon, Ind, and Cathay. Upon their return, the clan immediately pledged their allegiance to the Lords of Decay. It soon became obvious that the clan had used their time in the East well. 
as they were now the undisputed masters of secrecy, stealth, and assassination tactics, well beyond the skill or comprehension of the rest of the petty vermin. More than any other clan in Skaven society, Clan Eshin is shrouded in mystery, and little is known of their inner workings, and those who discover them suffer a swift death, vanish forever, or worse. They deal in secrets and death, and both do not come without extortionate cost, but for those willing to pay the high price and ask the right questions, the deadly services of the clan are in order. Any who dares to deal with these treacherous assassins and stealth masters can buy secrets gained from espionage. They can buy the location of secret entrances and passages well hidden from the general public, know the identity of shadowy figures, steal precious cargo, and poison the water systems of cities and settlements, among a variety of other tasks and missions that can be accomplished thanks to their unmatched skills. Assassins can also infiltrate any place and silence any desired target. Having some of the most devious and dangerous killers in the world, the clan has quickly risen to become one of the four major clans in all Skaven society. Only the most despicable, backstabbing, and cunning of Ratmen will find themselves representing their clan at the circular table of the Council of Thirteen and Clan Eshin's own Night Lord Sneak sits at the table before the Horned Rat's proxy. Lord Sneak is arguably one of the most powerful representatives of the dreaded Council, as he employs assassination and sabotage tactics against any foe that dares to interfere with his own plans and agenda. With Night Lord Sneak being one of the representatives, the clan's political reach has grown so strong they have the power to call any before the council a traitor, with no need for any evidence but their word. Not only do they have this power, they have the strength to enforce the council's edict, cowing and corralling the minor clans into line, while maintaining the authority and influence of the great clans such as their own. It is well known that Clan Eshin is the hidden knife in the paws of the Council of Thirteen. Whether the Lords of Decay have something over the shadowy clan, or have merely provided the best bribe, Clan Eshin provides the unseen force with which the Council maintains their reign. The constant removal of political and key opponents within the Under Empire and beyond has its drawbacks, and often delays greater plans. It is said that the Council of Thirteen maintain a rolling blacklist of 10,000 names marked for swift death. On this secret list are the world's leaders, be they man, elf, dwarf, and many other characters of renown. Despite complex schemes to undermine the powers of the world, most resources are instead used to silence internal opposition, quell the overambitious, and maintain the positions of the council. The assassins of Clan Eshin are so impressive in their abilities and performance, it is supposed by some that they have supernatural powers that allow them to move faster than a galloping horse, climb smooth surfaces, and disguise themselves in shadow as though they were clothed in it. However, these skills are the result of the clan's many centuries abroad, in the lands to the east, training and honing skills gathered from Nippon, Ind, and Cathay as well as developing many styles and techniques of their own. The well-trained assassins of Clan Eshin are always clad in black, using masks or cowls, rarely showing their faces. They excel in keeping themselves out of sight. These foul assassins show extreme proficiency in sneaking into every fortress. They hide in every shadow, working silently in the darkness. They dispense death with brutal and uncanny accuracy, before disappearing once more into the shadows leaving their foe lifeless and not knowing what hit them. Nothing was expected, and so the men were at ease. Sentries had been posted, but they too were weary from the road. We'd taken off our armor, set our weapons to the side. A pair of bruises from Altdorf were throwing dice and, and telling body jokes. 
Little did we realize that in mere moments, half our number would be dead, and the other half would be running for their lives. Although all the assassins of the clan are menacing killers who are cloaked in shadow, there is one above even their renown and prowess. Deathmaster Snitch, primary agent of Lord Sneak, is the most infamous and prolific of Clan Eshin's assassins. The mere thought of this cunning killer, let alone speaking the name aloud, is enough to make any warlord or lowly rat squint into the shadows, lest he be there. A true master of murder, Snix is shrouded in mystery and legend. No one knows the true location of the Death Master in any given moment except perhaps for the Grand Night Lord Sneak himself, as he is the only one the Death Master answers to. With such a famed reputation, it didn't take long for Night Lord Sneak to begin using this to his own and the Council's advantage. Those who refuse to follow the Council's orders or dare to cross Clan Eshin in any way can expect to be greeted by Clan Eshin's chief assassin at any time. Once marked by the assassin, no place or time is safe. Brutally efficient and absolutely without mercy, Snix makes quick work of those he is dispatched to remove with his weeping blades, even carrying one with his whip-like tail, and only ever leaves the right clues in his wake. He wears a mysterious cloak of shadows, woven from stolen human hair and spider silk. The cloak effectively conceals and silences the wearer. Although it is not just the passages and gutters of the underway that are haunted and horrified by the brutal actions and mark of the Death Master, the surface too has been subjected to the vile assassin's works. Beyond his formidable skills in the art of murder, Snix is also responsible for many of the most reviled and despicable acts of sabotage to befall the mighty races of the surface world. Slay, kill, poison man things, point ears and dwarf thing alike. Some of his most famous stories include the assassination of the celestial wizard Heinrich Frischen, who was found flayed within his still locked observatory, leaving the guards puzzled. This act prompted some to lay the blame at the feet of demons, those disgusting manifestations of the warp. But there were those clever enough to note that demons seldom leave so few clues. The skilled assassin is also the main suspect of many other crimes and acts of subterfuge, including the bombing of the Imperial Navy at Reichsport, the Great Fire of Lothurn, and the destruction of the dwarf engineer Thornick Thornson's Iron Cog Dragon on the eve of the Battle of Bitter Peaks. Snix is also likely to be the killer of King Belagar's own brother, the Dwarf Lord Dromgar, who lost his head against the swift blades of the Death Master. When Snix leaves clues, they are intentional and clear enough. Warlord Scott of Murkpit had his neatly removed head stacked atop the 100 heads from his Storm Vermin bodyguard. These are but some of the devious acts that Snix has worked upon the world. Although it is surely his most practiced and potent work, it is not only striking from the shadows that Snix excels at. For when the Skaven decide to use this devastating weapon on the enemy, Snix emerges seemingly from nowhere at will, in a blur of steel and daggers. Many an unfortunate lord has seen that whirlwind of blades, before their eyes were darkened forever. Perhaps there are none who truly know how many of the greatest tragedies were carried out by the hands of the Death Master. Despite his infamy, none know where Snix might be. His location is an absolute mystery. Once again, suiting Sneak in the Council's designs, for as long as none know where the Death Master might be, none can count themselves safe.
The clan does not only rely on sabotaging missions and tactics to break havoc on the enemy. They make for a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield, and many foes have fallen against the deadly tactics employed by these skilled Skaven. Among the troops of Clan Eshin, the most common warriors are the Night Runners. Despite being considered common troopers, they are still secretive and highly skilled. The Night Runners travel either in small furtive units to seize key terrain from the enemy, or they also move in larger blocks, scurrying ahead of the Skaven lines to slow down their enemies. Their weapons of choice are blades in each hand, although it has been seen that they can employ slings to rain death and war machines for lightly protected units. On occasions, units of Night Runners are given a warp grinder tunneling team to burrow beneath the ground and emerge upon the enemy's flank or rear to break havoc amongst their ranks. Their fast strikes are done to weaken the foe before the main attack and prepare the path for the rest of the horde to come. There tend to be high casualties in their ranks for their fight is always deep in the enemy territory. This is something the Clan Eshin Masters already know. Those Night Runners that survive and excel on the battlefield are chosen to learn yet more of the arts of the Clan and become Gutter Runners. Units of Gutter Runners are highly skilled in the mysterious fighting style developed and learned in the Far East by the Clan. They do not wear any armor, for they simply dodge any incoming attack from their foes. Arson attacks, night raids, and contaminated water supplies are all favorite tactics, often employed by these stealth troops. They use a variety of weapons and poisons to accomplish their tasks and they are chosen to carry some of the most dangerous missions for the clan, some of them even labeled as suicidal. Under the orders of the dreaded Council of Thirteen, they have traveled across the globe, stealing and destroying the recorded history of Skaven attacks from the great libraries of the Empire. Searched for ways to penetrate the Emerald Gates of Ulthwan, and located the descendants of the Von Karstein vampires. An unprecedented amount of secret knowledge flows every day into Skaven Blight, as the Council seeks to forever stay one step ahead of their many foes. Only the most promising of gutter runners are given the chance to prove themselves as worthy assassins of Clan Eshin. Deadly warriors that are almost invisible, and their very shadow is said to be poisonous. The final tests for the pinnacle of Clan Eshin's warriors are death missions, assigned by the ruling council of the clan, presided by Night Lord Sneak. After surviving such missions, the assassin is considered an acknowledged master in the methodology of murder. In the summer of 1115 of the Imperial Calendar, after Emperor Boris Goldgather fell to the sickness of the Black Plague, unleashed by the Skaven, the Empire of Man stood on the brink of ruin and collapse. It was then that the Council of Thirteen decided to launch a proper land attack, and destroy the hated Man-Things. While in disarray, the Empire struggled to retaliate against the overwhelming nightmare that was the Skaven fighting force. But there was one noble who would not be crushed without a fight. Mandred von Zelt, later known as Mandred Skavenslayer or Ratslayer, rallied against the hordes of Ratmen and led his men to many glorious victories. At the height of the Battle of the Howling Hills, Mandred raised his rune fang and struck the head of Warlord Vermic, a prominent member of the Council of Thirteen at the time. Fashioning the horned skull, into a disgusting hell that resides in the Imperial vaults to this day. With the forces of the Skaven scattered, Mandred was ascended to the Imperial throne with a majority vote. Alas, no great deed goes unpunished.
The Skaven clans, though bloodied, were now enraged and in disarray. But they dispatched one of the clanation's renowned assassins to enact their vengeance. In 1152 IC, the Emperor Mandred Ratslayer was slain by Nartic of Clan Eshin by order of the Council of Thirteen. False evidence of a mutant apparition was left before the shadowy assassin escaped into the sewers. In the wake of his death, the Electoral Council was halted by stalemate, leading to a series of civil wars while no emperor was elected for several years. To this day, Scholars and lore masters failed to connect the Black Plague, the Skaven incursion, and the murder of the Emperor. Over time, Skaven were dismissed as a threat to the Empire, and within centuries, what was known about the Ratmen became so enshrouded in myth that many men now refuse to believe in their existence at all. Night Lord's mission will be complete. Yes, yes. Druki Elf Thing has what I came for. And just in, in time, Long Limb Nofa tries to scurry escape on his big black paddle boat back to Druki Home Nest. I need only to get back to Nagaroth with this Black Ark's cargo of scrolls. But first, I will end this here and now! be allowed to follow me back to the land of chill. The elusive Death Master is nearby. Let him come. Should he get close, by Cain's cup, I will cut him down, along with the rest of his pathetic fruit.
As with all Skaven clans, Clan Eshin is cunningly deceitful and self-serving with their base Skaven characteristics combined with their extreme proficiency in the arts of sabotage, secrets, and working in the shadows. The powerful Clan Eshin and its shadow-cloaked assassin heroes, spearheaded by the infamous and prolific Deathmaster Snitch, are a horrifying and disturbing threat to all those on the surface. The children of the Horned Rat are a monstrous force, not to be taken lightly by any of those who dwell beneath the open sky and bask in the warmth of the sun. Clan Scryer is one of the four greater clans of the Under Empire, alongside Clan Mulder, Clan Pestilence, and Clan Eshin, and their Lord Warlock Morskitar sits on the twelfth seat at the table of the Council of Thirteen before the Horned Rat's proxy. Through their service to the Council, by supplying twisted machinery, Clan Scryer cements its position of power. They are not necessarily the only clan to produce machines that darken the battlefields and tunnels of the underworld. Clan Pestilence, for example, build their great plague furnaces to spread disease and horror onto the enemy. The clan Scryer has the upper hand in skill and production speed above any others. Their influence is matched only by their wealth, as they are fond of lending their deadly weapons for exorbitant prices. Through indescribable combinations of arcane sorcery, twisted with mad science and engineering, Clan Scryer are able to produce the most horrible and destructive weapons and machinery available to the Skaven race, and arguably the entire world. As such, they remain as the greatest to forge the most potent of weapons and never allow the other clans to forget about this fact. The machines of war that are produced by the clan are churned out of the warp stone fueled warp forges beneath Skaven blight with startling speed. These dark places stink with smoke and death. Numerous pieces of broken machinery, wasted oil and rusted scrap litter the ground. Warpstone deposits light the obscure passages and chambers that make the underground. Through the tunnels and unseen halls, one can hear the roaring of the uncountable infernal machines that work unceasingly until they inevitably break apart. Make all these stinking reptiles die, die! Murder, death, kill devices, at ready! While Clan Scryer are most known for their war machines, such as the Warp Fire Throw, the Rattling Gun, and the Warp Grinder, they are responsible for many of the greatest advances of their vile race, creating gigantic earth movers and rock drills that are used in the Skaven mines. The warp ray, and even the far squeaker, which allows rats to communicate almost instantly across vast distances. It is known that when new machines and inventions are put to use, they are just as likely to succeed as they are to fail. Often this being realized too late by the Skaven crew responsible of managing the machines. Thousands upon thousands of Skaven have perished suddenly, being consumed by violent explosions or trapped under the bulk of a malfunctioning machine of war. However, the Skaven, being as numerous as they are, can try to make things work again and again affording to lose all the necessary Skaven slaves in the process. For the Ratmen, there's always more bodies ready to be put to good use.
The Warlock engineers play a vital part in the production of the many inventions that come out of the furnaces and testing grinds. Their specialty is the abhorrent blending of dark magic and arcane technology. And while the vast array of weapons and devices they develop are often just as deadly to the Skaven wielding them as they are to any opponent, the Scryer engineers generally seem to care extremely little about precise craftsmanship. Scryer's most powerful engineers meld sorcery and science until the two are indivisible. These individuals are called Warlock Engineers, and they are more akin to walking arsenals than to Skaven. Warp energy crackles from the blades that emerge from the flesh of their arms, and their rat-like bodies are covered in all manner of bizarre artifice. Tubes and wires pulse and buzz with unholy life as they connect the engineer to his harness and its fantastic apparatus. Fearful and horrible indeed is Scryer's technology, if it allows such an unholy alliance of flesh and machine. The backbone of Clan Scryer is without any shadow of a doubt the warlock engineers, ingenious ratmen who are both inventors and magicians in equal measure, many even being full-fledged wizards. They are widely considered to be the greatest minds in the Under Empire, who craft some of the most vile and devious devices in the whole world. When not overseeing a weapons team or manning their war machines themselves, they have the ability to perform acts of magic, much like any other race. However, since their grasp on the winds of magic is not as powerful or masterful as their own Grey Seers, the Warlock Engineers are heavily reliant on their death machines and even personal arms to annihilate the enemy. Their weapons and tools ranging from warp-lock muskets, poisoned wind globes, to arcane blades imbued with mysterious warpstone energies. It is important to mention that warpstone is one of the main substances used by the Skaven to power their own diabolical machinations. When the dark magic that flows into the world concentrates and grows powerful, it can take the form of crystallized stones that glow with a sickly greenish shade. This is more commonly known as Warpstone, and despite its many risks, it is highly coveted by necromancers, alchemists, and sorcerers alike. Yet none scour this rare substance more than the Skaven. Warpstone is used by the Ratmen to power their twisted technology and to enhance their own obscure magic spells. The resource is so favored by the Skaven that it is even used as currency within their society. Skaven warlocks are commonly known to look incessantly for this resource to power their crazy inventions and machines. Ickit has the biggest brain of all rats! <laughs> Just a simple, masterful scheme. Yes, yes. Ickit Claw, the master warlock engineer of Clan Scryer, is able to blend arcane sorceries with technology in an insane and mind-boggling mix. His ability to blur the line between science and the power of magic is nothing less than remarkable. Being a tall skaven, covered in white fur, Ikit Claw is easily recognized as a figure of power and influence amongst the Ratmen. Under Ikit Claw's order, vast foundries and massive tunnels have been made to allocate for the foundation of the clan's many forges, and thousands of Skaven have perished during the countless experiments that take place in these dark places.
is Ikit Claw constantly studies and pursues his diabolical goal to create more murderous weapons of destruction. In his madness and obsession, he has traveled to far Cathay, stolen technology from the Dark Elves in the far Nakaroth, and has even risked the wrath of Clan Pestilence by journeying through the steaming jungles of Lustria and visiting the monolithic ruins which have stood there since the beginning of time. All in the name of acquiring more and more knowledge to prove to the world that he is the best warlock engineer to ever live. In his own quest for knowledge, the Skaven warlock mangled his body after a failed experiment caused by a big explosion, nearly killing him. An intricate iron mask of his own invention now covers his hairless skull, and a wrought iron exoskeleton aids his withered left side. He has a cunningly made skeletal claw of iron, crystal and brass, to give strength to his withered arm. The claw contains several of his more successful inventions, including a small warp fire projector, which he has used many times against foes, and even fellow Skaven engineers and slaves alike. As long as this wicked rat lives, the world cannot rest, for more and deadlier inventions will continue to pour out of the damned forges of the underworld. One of the most brutal machines devised by the Tinker Rats of Clan Scryer is the Doom Wheel, a colossal engine which name may sound comical to some, but those who have faced one in battle know of its devastating power. It is a terrifying engine of destruction which has smashed its way through the serried ranks of dwarf, orc, beastmen, and human regiments alike. These machines often wreak havoc and the bloodiest murder upon the field. With an outer wooden ring, reinforced by iron, and armed with a collection of razor-sharp blade, it houses a metal treadmill within. This treadmill is operated by two skaven to generate enough power to lift the machine's warp stone generator. This generator in turn fires warp lightning at those unfortunate enough to stand in the Doom Wheel's path. A design simultaneously genius and moronic that still confounds even the keenest of minds at the Imperial Colleges of Engineers in Nome. The Doom Wheel was invented by Ikit Claw by harnessing the power of raw warp stone to create energy discharges. It is a terrifying engine of destruction that rolls forward with no intentions of stopping. Anyone foolish enough to hold his ground before this infernal machine is blasted apart by the warp light or crushed under the heavy doom will itself. While many of the clan's inventions are widely known, few are thought to be as mighty as the warp lightning cannon believed by many to be the pinnacle in the blend of magic and engineering and of Skaven ingenuity as a whole. A device that perfectly blends the arcane with science and as such can crumble even the mightiest of castle walls like a sand castle caught in a tidal wave. The cannon generates warp lightning in a huge sphere to the rear of the cannon which, once sufficiently charged, fires a bolt of pure, concentrated warp lightning towards valuable targets in the enemy's army. The bolt moves too quickly to be seen and arcs into the heart of the enemy before bursting into a cloud of warp energy, leaving only a greenish vapor behind to track its path. Although insanely fast and powerful, these cannons all show the signs of long-term use and overworking of their already crude design. It is well known the bulky outer hulls 
often barely contain the raging forces within and can be as unreliable as they are deadly. Sometimes taking the operating weapons team with him in a colossal green fireball of warp fire energy. While the heroes and mightiest minds of Clan Scryer always have and always will be the warlock engineers, there will always be a need for clan rats to shoulder the majority of the military burden. Being one amongst the untold number of Scryer's clan rats comes with its advantages. The clan's infantry troops are never alone on the battlefield and are supported by brutal and hellish firepower. As such, there is a group of special engineers whose mission is to operate the vile war machines that are deployed in full-scale battles or specific special operations. These weapons teams unleash the force of a wide variety of devices upon the enemy. Devices such as the Rattling Gun, a weapon capable of unleashing an unimaginable amount of firepower in an extremely short period of time oftentimes leaving the enemy shredded to pieces or heavily wounded, just wondering what happened. These weapons are usually deployed as a support element for the wave attacks of the clan rats, a situation that is as beneficial as it is terrifying for them. Skaven chieftains will happily order the gunners to fire into their own engaged clan rats if it serves the purpose of killing the enemy. Something that the clan rats are all too aware of. This multi-barreled Deathbringer, so popular among the warlords of different clans, that Clan Scryer will always run out of guns before running out of customers to sell them to. While the mighty yet bloody war engines of the Warplock Engineer's design are effective and brutal, in not simply dispatching, but destroying the enemy en masse. There are always times in the field of battle that require a more precise and delicate hand. The Jezail is the longest ranged rifle known to all the races of the world, those who walk above and below. And in the paws of a highly trained Skaven, these rifles can be used to devastating effect removing key targets from the enemy's ranks. On such occasions that a paw leader considers it necessary to deploy his warplock jezails, a two skaven team will set out, one to prop the insanely lengthy barrel and one to fire it, to deal silent and precise death to the enemy. While much of the effectiveness of the jezails surely stems from the incredible sniper training that these Skaven receive, a great deal more undoubtedly rests with the ammunition. The Jezio fires rounds crafted from pure warp stone, which explains why these weapons have the longest range of any rifle and the significant damage it can deal. But there is always a trade-off. While superior in range and often damage output, the warpstone rounds also reduce the fire rate of the Josiah, which, also due to its cumbersome length, must be stationary to fire. However, despite their unwieldy nature, the warplock Josiahs are an invaluable asset to their paw leader, and by extension, the whole of the clan scryer. Similar to the engineers, and some even being of that role themselves, the Poisoned Wind Globadiers are one of the vilest units Clan Scryer can bring to bear. One of the newest additions to the Clan's already sizable biological warfare forces, these Globadiers clad in ghoulish metal masks and equipped with rebreather equipment are trained to launch their glass orbs of toxic gas into the thickest pockets of fighting they can find on the field. It is of no consequence to the Globadiers or the poisoned wind orbs that they launch into the fray, which side the combatants represent. 
all those who breathe the abhorrent fumes of the orbs succumb to a violent and agonizing death in mere seconds. While many would rightly fear to encounter these vile fiends in their gas masks on the battlefield, their poisoned wind globes are as nothing to their even more notorious and horrific cousins, death globes. These glass orbs are filled with warpstone gas and fired into the midst of the fight by the death globe bombardiers. Almost identical to the globadiers, yet the more elaborate in the design of their protective gear and the useless arcane armor they often sport beneath their robes. The Death Globes are much like the Poisoned Wind Globes. However, they are even more potent, their contents being known to cause severe pain and even death merely upon contact with skin. It is a dire fate awaiting any of those unfortunate enough to inhale the toxic warpstone fumes. The lungs spontaneously begin to fill with a bubbling, roiling pus that causes an almost instant yet agonizing demise to the poor soul on the receiving end. It is no wonder why these Globadiers and their cousin Bombardiers are so widely feared and hated wherever they appear. Truly, Clan Scryer is deserving of its fearsome and brutal reputation. There must be many throughout the old world who live in constant fear of encountering the hellish machines from the menace below. There will be many more that live in never-ending dread that one day the vile and hated Skaven, specifically the horrifying warlock engineers of Clan Scryer, will begin to pay more attention to the quality and craftsmanship of their inventions in the applications. Truly, if the foul rats decided to further refine their already devastating war machines and unite amongst themselves, then the Skaven would be one of the strongest, if not the dominant force of the old world as a whole, not just the underways they call home. You must understand, I was down there, in the Skaven capital. That horrid city is every bit as ugly as the rumors insist, and much more. I've seen the Skaven of Scryer and their technology. Things that could bring down castles, eradicate armies, and bring cities to ruin. I've seen pestilence manufacturing their terrible contagions. I've heard the Greysears mutter unintelligible mystic phrases and working spells for their dark god. I've seen agents of Eshen return from missions carrying heads of their targets and bringing critical information to the Council's ears. So many hateful creatures simultaneously working together and conspiring against each other. It was most terrifying. I wish to never go back there, ever again. Having their dark origins in the jungle continent of Lustria many centuries ago, the Plague Monks are the main core that forms the strength and might of Clan Pestilence. These are wicked creatures, and they are already immune to pain and disease, as they have embraced them in their bodies, all in reverence to the Great Horned Rat that provides them with the resilience to resist the toxic diseases they carry. They serve their god of pestilence with such devotion that they can be said to be religious zealots in their own right. They inflict themselves with sickness and they gain strength from it. They have been responsible for the bloody Skaven civil wars 
that have involved the entire Under Empire and the number of lives of Ratman and other creatures lost to these conflicts are simply too terrible, if not impossible, to tell. The Disciples of Decay spread their contagions with fervor, and they employ war machines, mutated creatures, special weapons, and magic to spread the virulence to their enemies and even fellow Ratmen alike. For they believe that in spreading pestilence, they are rewarded by the Great Horned Rat in return. When the Skaven want to spread their diseases upon the enemy, they start by infecting their cities. They stealthily intoxicate the wells, sewers, tunnels, and food deposits to make sickness appear amongst the unsuspecting victims, before any battle or confrontation has truly begun. The impact of these actions often range from a hit on valuable supplies, lowered morale, to even many intoxicated casualties. On the field of battle, lines of sensor bearers wield sacred plague sensors to spread virulence and toxic gases on the enemy ranks, oftentimes resulting in their victims falling prey to the plague that suffocates their lungs and blinds their vision. High above, corrosive substances fired from towering plague claw catapults fly over the battle lines, leaving a trail of deadly greenish smoke behind. Upon impact, Deadly fumes and substances spread throughout the ranks of enemies, filling their lungs with foul fluid and choking them to death. Despair begins to reign as the main battle line of Skaven close the distance. As they approach, their victims are already weak in body and spirit, the air choked with toxic gas. In close combat, the Plague Monks and Sensor Bearers are truly fanatical in their fighting, attacking with their rusted swords and spiked flails. They go on murderous rampages, frenzied even further by the exotic combination of toxic fumes, choking gases, and many other unknown substances. They fight while endlessly screaming rites of infection towards their foe, this can drive any man to insanity, if he isn't already broken from the gratuity of pestilence and death that surround him. Above the chaotic noise of battle, a dreadful bell tolls. The horrific sound source is an ominous bell attached to the top of the plague furnaces deadly altars dedicated to the Great Horned Rat that the Skaven push into battle to spread disease, virulence, and terror with a massive wrecking ball that swings back and forth in an arc of death. A cloud of noxious gases envelop this unholy construct as it opens gaps in the enemy's formations. It is said that the Skaven even the most trained of the Vermintide, are not necessarily the most expert of fighters. But when fighting in overwhelming numbers, they can be unstoppable. It is with pure force of numbers and the help of deadly substances that Clan Pestilence wages war. And uncountable are the lives that have been lost to this great major clan. The physical appearance of the foul Skaven that can form this clan is oftentimes hideous. They carry a nauseating stench, and to touch them is to be tainted with horrific disease. Many of the victims that come into contact with a plague monk or a plague weapon are known to suffer agonizing deaths, while traditional healing methods and medicines do not work most times. 
one notorious skaven who is a testament to the power of the great horned rat is the legendary disciple of decay known as Lord Skrulk. This being is corrupted and twisted to the core and is alive despite having lived longer than any of his kind. Innumerable maladies and diseases plague his body and he drips pus and toxic fluids. The fact that he still walks and is the Plague Lord of Clan Pestilence is evidence enough that their foul god grants endurance, power, resilience, and longer life to the truly devout. Wherever Lord Scrope walks, the air turns black, and living things are left dying in his wake, as the putrescent aura he carries is truly poisonous. In fact, he is also known as the disease that walks. He leads the deadly armies of Clan Pestilence from the front, unleashing his fury mercilessly against the ones who stand against him. But to understand how this clan was born, and how they ascended to being one of the most prominent powers of the Under Empire, one must explore their origins from their inception, to their trials in Lustria, and their return to the Old World. Dwarf and man fought to the last, but none of those who dwelt in Khazar would live to see that battle pass. Tearing, biting, all devouring. The Skaven chewed on flesh and bone. The man and dwarf did fall together. Their blood spilled over the ancient stone. The story of the Skaven is little known to the outside world. For there are few who wish to bear such damned knowledge and fewer still who do and are considered sane by the polite society. Indeed, even for the Skaven themselves, their history matters little, for they have short memory. What really matters is the time between now and when their ultimate master plan to dominate the world will bear fruit. They think of the past only in the matter of who stood in their way and, as such, who they need to get rid of to achieve their destiny. But there is one piece of literature that is universally agreed to be the tale of the origin of this most disgusting of races. The doom that came to Kavzar. The city that once bore that name was located between the Irana Mountains to the north in the Talayan Sea to the south. Mentioned in the epic poem already cited, originally written in the dwarf tongue of Khaled, whose original writer is lost to history. The city was founded by one of the first tribes of humans, and joined by a wandering clan of dwarves. The city was beyond anything else human made when it came to architecture and engineering. Most famously, it had one single massive temple in the center of the city, a nice skyscraping tower, but it was never finished. For the further it got from the ground, the more difficult it was to build. That was until a stranger arrived and offered to finish the building in a single night. Under the condition that he placed a shrine to his own god at the top. The humans agreed to these conditions, and the stranger got to work. The following night, the tower was complete to the surprise of all, and a massive bell was placed on top of it, and the mysterious man 
was no more. From that cursed night, the bell tolled thirteen times, and doom fell over the city. Every night the bell tolled thirteen times, as rain and pestilence arrived, and the rats of the city grew hungry, bold, and big. The rain never stopped, the food ran out, and the very citizens of Kavzar were hunted by giant rats. Eventually, the rats rose up in a massive tide and ate whatever was left of the population. Pestilence, as one can see, is part of the very creation of the Skaven race. And Clan Pestilence in particular would embrace it like no other. In the time that it took to turn Kavzar into what it is now known as Skaven Blight, Warpstone rained from the skies and the Skaven rejoiced in it. But eventually, the mines of that warped mineral ran out, and overpopulation was so high that cannibalism among Skaven had become a tradition to weave out the weak and sustain themselves. And so the first wave of Skaven migration began. Throughout the old world did they spread like a cancer that ate its way deep beneath the bowels of civilizations in vast territories. Araby, the Southlands, and even far-off Cathay was not far enough for the Skaven to travel. And even the wet jungles of Lustria saw a wave of Skaven migration. And those who went there would indeed be very special. This period of early expansion was later called the Great Sniff. Such a paradise, unblemished, pure. It must be gifted the touch, touch of pestilence. That the reptile things attack me, me for this is blasphemy. It happened that the Skaven that traveled to Lustria found themselves immediately besieged on all sides by flesh-devouring parasites, savage lizardmen who were the true owners and defenders of Lustria, wandering and massive carnivorous creatures, and of course, tropical diseases, the latter of which came to be seen as a test sent by their unholy god, the Horned Rat for only the strong would survive it. The diseases were terrible, and the Skaven died faster than they could reproduce. Eventually, the Skaven in Lustria came to believe that they had to find victims to sacrifice in the name of the Horned Rat, for the deity to grant them the gifts and the necessary strength to endure the many diseases that were assailing them. If they revered the very infections and poxes that were killing them, they would be spared. And so they did, out of dire desperation and pain. The plague monks were born. The Skaven did what they always do. They infested every corner, every open niche they occupied. And with only a few of their short generations, they developed immunity to the deadly plagues. They mutated and came to see these wicked alterations as holy gifts of their disgusting god. So it was that the Cult of Decay, a subset of the mainstream Skaven religion, was born. In the case of the Lizardmen, they too had a new deity they worshipped, Tehenwaim, also known as the Prophet of Sotek, rallied a massive army under his banner, 
proclaiming that only by sacrificing the blood of the rats to their serpent god Sotek would they be liberated from the vile Skaven race that threatened their existence. The new prophet preached that Sotek would only surface if his servants spilled the blood of millions of ratmen in his name. And so they did. The Lizardmen's vast armies, conformed of beasts of all sizes, marched across Lustria to ambush the vermin race in their lairs and underground tunnels. In return, the Lizardmen's cities and temples were attacked by the Skaven armies, and thousands upon thousands of cold-blooded ones were left riddled with agonizing diseases that had no cure. During the hundred years of this terrible war of attrition between the Rat and the Serpent, uncountable Lizardmen and Skaven were slaughtered. This is recorded as one of the bloodiest conflicts in all of the lore, for the blood ran in rivers in Lustria, and the death toll was terrible. After their lands had been truly and completely spent by their rotting ways, and the cruel war with the Lizardmen was coming to a close, the so-called plague monks decided to return to their origins. And so the great migration of clan pestilence back to the old world took place. After weeks of travel in ramshackle boats made of wood and spare materials, they made landfall in the Southlands, establishing a new stronghold there. Shortly after, the Lords of Decay sent emissaries to Skaven Blight to announce their return and their intention to spread the new cult of decay. The Council of Thirteen had no need for a new faction and murdered the Fellowship on the spot, sending back their severed heads as a lesson of humility. As a response, the Lords of Decay seized the human city of Bagrusa in what seemed to be a desperate fit of anger. But the true objective was the Skaven stronghold of Clan Murkit beneath the city. For months, they surrounded the rat burrows around them, placing cauldrons filled with warpstone brews so foul we shall not name them here. Or to even mention them brings terrible bad luck. The noxious gases flow down the tunnels, flooding them with terrible disease and rot. The few who ran to the surface were captured and enslaved. The rest turned into rotting chunks of meat. From that siege, only very few had escaped including Lord Murkett and a few of his lieutenants. In retaliation, the Council of Thirteen sent innumerable clan rats, supported by warlock engineers and their terrible technology. But they had been too slow. For even before the army left Skavenblight, numerous warlord clans of the Southlands had turned to the side of the Plague Lords in fear of their brutal ways. The underways of the Skaven Empire had broken into a full civil war. As the Council lost more and more clans to the cause of the Cult of Decay, indeed, opportunistic clans regularly switched sides, gnawing at the opportunities that the chaotic conflict presented. But eventually, the entirety of the Southlands was lost to the control of the Plague Lords. The Under Empire was divided into two hemispheres. The South under control of the Lords of Decay, and the Old World under control of the Council of Thirteen. This struggle lasted for 400 years, and it brought destruction, misery, and above all, decay 
to the entirety of the Southlands. Everything changed with the return of yet another powerful clan from far away. Clan Eshin. Coming all the way from Cathay, trained in the ways of subterfuge and assassination like no other in the entire world. They pledged allegiance to the Council and set to work undermining Clan Pestilence's control of the Southlands. Clad in all black, and with weapons so deadly they are rumored to be able to kill demigods. They slowly, but surely, set the unruly clans back under the control of the Council. Seeing that they were losing ground quickly, Clan Pestilence was forced into the negotiation table, and so they requested a full audience with the Council of Thirteen. Nurglich, the most powerful lord of decay, traveled north to Skavenblight. Uncountable assassination attempts on his life were made. In uncountable times did he come off unscathed on the other side. The assassins suffering horrible, plague-ridden fates. Eventually he did arrive to Skavenblight, and there he asked to be added to the council offering his and his clan's expertise to be used by them. I kill dwarf things in Pillar City. No, no! Clan wars go to Southlands. Hunt for Wolfstone. Moors are puppet minion. Pestilence infest Lastria. Yes, yes! But all Wolfstone for Council Plan! As insurance, he revealed that he and his followers had brought with them a virulent strain of yellow skull fever, and should an agreement not be made, he would release it inside Skavenblight, most likely wiping out the entire council and most of the Skaven race itself. What a favor to the world that would be, but alas it would not come to pass. For Nurglich proved himself to be strong enough to pass the trial of combat, slaying one of the council members and taking his place. So it was that after hundreds of years of civil war, the Under Empire was united once more, now presenting a bigger threat than ever for the rest of the world. The Empire had very little awareness of the menace below their own civilization. Indeed, a thousand years after Sigmar had departed, and the Empire had already contained many of the enemies from outside, there came a calamity that was born from within. Indeed, when Boris Goldgather arguably the most corrupt emperor in history, was on the throne and the provinces were in open civil war. The Skaven struck. Five hundred years in the making, the evil scheme of the Skaven's first blow was invisible as a terrible outbreak of black death started in Null. Many died from the plague, and its spread was blamed on Talaian merchants. It was the doing of Clan Pestilence once again. Terrible and horrible was the efficiency of the new weaponry of the Council. Thanks to Clan Pestilence, three out of four Imperial citizens had perished even before any sword was drawn. This single clan had brought the mightiest human nation of the old world to its knees with a deadly plague. And it was only by the blessings of Sigmar and Ulrich that they survived, thanks to Mandred Skavenslayer. Clan Pestilens was not satisfied, for it was their holy prerogative to spread the plagues. 
700 years after the invasion of the Empire, the deadly Red Pox was unleashed in Bretonia. It first appeared in the Dukedom of Bordeaux, before spreading to Brion, and east to the Brian River, and south into Talea. Once more, the Skaven's terrible and extremely efficient strategy was put into deadly practice. They would wait until the human kingdoms were weak and poor from the plague, riddled with depopulation and starvation. Then they would attack with full force. And so it was. They emerged as a deadly vermintide, consuming it all. They sacked Brienne and Miragliano, and lay siege to Canel. But the lords of Northern Bretonia were brave, and chivalry drove them. As such, they rallied their armies quickly, much quicker than the Empire had done centuries before, and attacked in an epic and valiant charge. Many knights fell, as many oaths were taken and subsequently accomplished. But the result was worth it. They had driven the Skaven back to their damned burrows. The cost was high, though, and it took the Bretonians, nobles and peasants alike, many years to recover. This was by no means the last time Clan Pestilence would act, for they believe wholeheartedly that their fellow Ratmen had been led astray by the Grey Seers, and that the way of the plague is the true way of worshipping the Horned Rat. Indeed, even now, centuries after the civil war that they had caused, Clan Pestilence's ultimate goal is to bring the rest of the Under Empire under their fold and they have not stopped working towards that goal. Of course, the clan does this all in secrecy, without being labeled an all-out heretic by the Grey Seers, to avoid yet another devastating civil war. But make no mistake, their goal is total submission of the entirety of the Skaven race and only when they achieve this goal, the Great Ascendancy will begin. Where the Horned Rat manifests into the world, and all the Skaven race will ascend to the surface as a whole to take what is rightfully theirs, the entire world. Life is short and expendable in Skaven Blight, and all have a role to fulfill, no matter how small, no matter how futile. In fact, all Skaven act in the interests of their selves, following their deeply egotistical and treacherous nature. Vermankind as a whole, however, never forgets its ultimate goal, the conquest of the surface world. With pestilence or warp lightning, with trickery or overwhelming might, it matters not how this objective is achieved. Meanwhile, the four great clans, Pestilence, Scryer, Eshen, and Molder, ascended to power through the means and blessings bestowed upon them by the Great Horned Rat. They are left often wondering what exactly is Clan Moore's secret to keep their ranks uncommonly united and focused on their cause. This powerful clan doesn't exhibit any over-commitment to a single way of warfare when they do battle. Instead, they are versatile and can switch from one tactic 
to another according to the developments of their current situation. Also, they do not seem to possess any particular means of being overpowered. And this is because its clan strength and position of power isn't something that can be easily picked up. It's not a source of energy, magic, neither a secret weapon they have at their disposal. It is said by some that no other warlord clan is as powerful as Clan Moors. Its name, feared among all vermankind, is pronounced with care and constrained respect, even amongst the four great clans. But from where exactly does Clan Moors gain its power? The answer is one to astonish all vermankind. Loyalty. They gain control over what is probably the most subtle and powerful tool of war, an unquestionable and unwavering loyalty to the clan. All members of Clan Moors are hardly bribed, and speak highly of their home and their leaders, while also showing a sense of belonging and fealty completely foreign to all other Skaven, who often recur to treachery and deception amongst their own ranks, always looking for themselves, and thus undermining the progress of their clan as a whole. The rats of Clan Moors believe in the leadership they follow, and they all work together into making Moors the most powerful clan in all of the Under Empire. They have common purpose. This is something other clans have a hard time understanding as there has never been a place for honor in the Under Empire. All Skaven are consumed by a primordial need to survive and thrive off the violence and brutality they inflict upon their own kin. It's a brutal society where feelings like pity, empathy, or remorse are completely unheard of and that is why Clan Moors has a unique advantage over all other clans. Where any other Skaven can be easily bribed or forced into betraying its master for their own gain, the same can't be said for Clan Moors members. And this makes for a deceivably powerful weapon. It needs to be said, however, that a concept such as honor in Skaven society, even in its best representation, remains a twisted and dark parody of its original intended meaning. In fact, betrayal isn't new to Clan Moors. It is just viewed in a different, maybe more pragmatic manner, if you wish so. To turn your back sabotage or outright kill a superior for your own egotistical gains is seen as an act of betrayal and it is aptly punished. However, if such a gesture was committed to getting rid of a selfish superior whose motives were corrupted by its own egotistical nature, then on the contrary, Clan Moors would see to it as a great act, as it would advance the objectives of the clan. Furthermore, what makes Clan Moors stand apart from most other clans is its varied ways of warfare. Where the four great clans are pretty set in their own methods of destruction, Clan Moors has proven time and time again to be extremely adaptable to any situation. 
Their forces have a heavier focus on armored infantry, hosting the biggest regiment of storm vermin in all Skaven. Their chieftains and warlords have learned a vast array of tactics that they have been seen to employ into battle with great effects. Where the four great clans utilize devastating weapons of war to defeat their enemies, subterfuge to take down vital targets, or even poison and biological weapons to cause heavy casualties, Clan Moors takes great pride in the fact that they have no need of expensive machinery or wild, raging beasts to achieve their goals in battle, resorting to simple, plain knowledge and effective tactics. This is why out of all Skaven clans, Clan Moors is one of the most feared for its unpredictability. Their leaders are great tacticians and masters of war, and few can hope to best them when at the lead of the unending hordes of Skaven that they can throw at any enemy. Few names in Skaven Blight instill more fear than Lord Nodwell, the supreme and merciless war king, tyrant general, supreme ruler of Clan Moors. His story is one coated in bloodshed and greed. Without him, Clan Moors would have never become the great force it is today. He is one of the oldest Skaven in existence, thanks to the acquisition of potent elixirs from Clan Scryer, and as such, the clan has never known another leader than Nodwell. Despite his age, however, his mind and body remain as sharp as ever. While he is dressed with the most delicate of fabrics scavenged from the world above, tailored by the most skilled slaves in all of Skavenblight. He remains an imposing figure, with a barrel-chested muscular physique, still capable of moving like a warrior and thinking like a cold-blooded killer. He lives a segregated life in his imposing tower over at Clan Moore's quarters in Skavenblight guarded by a regiment of black-furred storm vermin, the larger and mightier of their kind. And from high above in his chambers, he plots the day of the great ascent to the world above, when he would bring Skaven kind to the ultimate victory. But every leader needs a right-hand man, or, in this case, a right-hand claw. And to Lord Nodwell, second in command is no short of titles. <laughs> no other rat must slay more than me. me. Any who attempt to outkill me, me will pay. <laughs> Get them! <laughs> Get them now, now! Warlord Queek. Headtaker, Lord of the City of Pillars, and Great Warlord of Clan Moors, is one of the best warriors among all vermankind, probably second only to his own master, Lord Nodwell. He is a particularly egotistical and bloodthirsty being, whose legendary temper and might have made him infamous both above and below the surface. Gifted with an unnatural sense of courage and urge to accomplish even the most impossible challenges thrown his way. And as such, he displays the trophies of some of his greatest achievements on the trophy rack he brings along wherever he goes, strapped to his back. 
There can be found the hand of Baron Albrecht Kraus of the province of Averland, the head of King Krug Ironhand of Karak Draj, that of Warlord Ickit Scratch of Fester Spike, and that of Warlord Sleek Sharpwit of Clan Moors, amongst many other noteworthy challengers that Queek has personally taken down. If anything, Queek exacerbates all the qualities Lord Nodwell has instilled in his troops, these being a twisted sense of courage, pride, and loyalty. It is said that Queek cannot be bribed. He doesn't care for threats, no matter the dealer, and leads his armies from the front ever so fearlessly, instead of the back, much like the vast majority of other Skaven. He also thinks of himself as the greatest warlord to have ever lived, as all Skaven do. Unlike most Skaven, however, he is known to back up his claims as much as he boasts about them. But together with all these qualities, the Headtaker is known also for his madness, showing a disturbing affection for his collection of severed heads that he keeps upon his trophy rack. At times, he has been seen talking to these heads when nobody else is looking, as if the skulls still retain the souls of those he slew in ritual combat, and are now acting as his personal counselors in defeating his opponents and winning battles. Those that would dare to touch his prized possessions have had their paws cut off by Queek personally as a punishment. Together with his madness comes his foolhardiness, for Queek has never been described as the most brilliant of tacticians. On the contrary, Queek has always been considered by Lord Nodwell himself as a blunt tool to pursue his own goals, a skaven unlike most of his kind that hates scheming as much as he hates politics and subterfuge, which is one of the reasons why he holds such a great disdain for the conniving Grey Seers and the sorcerers of other clans. As a result of his own paranoia, Queek has never trod the battlefield alone, for he is always accompanied by a host of infamous storm vermin named the Red Guard, captained by his second-in-command, Ska Bloodtail, an immense scaven, even bigger than Queek himself. The Red Guard is feared across all of the Under Empire, as they are exceptionally good fighters, even able to come to blows against great warriors of other races. They are known to have taken down giants, they have killed kings and warlords, and they have even stolen sacred banners from renowned units such as Dwarf Ironbreakers. Weak Headtaker remains a truly terrible foe on the battlefield, availing himself of his bloodlust, skill, and fearless spirit. He truly is Lord Nodwell's protege, one of his greatest tools of destruction, and one of the mightiest warriors amongst the vermin kind. Dwarf things. Look how they scurry to us on such little legs, racing to fight, fight. We will give them battle. Yes, yes. I'll take back Gouger and collect many beards this day, day. The dwarves looked in disgust 
at the advancing scaven across the vast tunnel passage. They moved as if the very rocks of the mountains and the dark passages were theirs, moving swiftly as if they were in their own home. But the depths of the mighty mountains and the holds of the Karaz Encore were the dwarves' own place. The dwarf lord surveyed the battlefield, knowing that blood was about to run. The Skaven army was huge, the numbers greater than they expected. Towering above them, quick head takers rack of disgusting trophies defied the nerve and patience of the defending dwarves. Singing the songs of Verlea and sounding their war horns, the dwarves clashed against the coming tide of Skaven armed with all sorts of weapons and armor. Waves of screaming Skaven hurled themselves at the stubborn dwarf warriors who fought back with unwavering determination. Reciting their grudges as they killed, the dwarves shattered armor and bones with each swing of their mighty hammers and axes, their blows always finding their marks. But for each Skaven that fell, four more took their place, and the fighting quickly turned to a bloody grind, as waves and waves of fresh Skaven found their way to the front lines. The tunnels that led to the main hall were suddenly packed with more red-eyed ratmen that intended to enter the battlefield and get into the action. As individuals, the Skaven would cowardly scurry away from any conflict, but when acting as a horde, they empowered themselves and emboldened their deadly intent. And with a battlefield so packed as this one, they were eager to get into the fight to prove themselves to the clan. The crude war horns of the Skaven sounded all over the vast hall, drowning the voices of the dwarves and the sounds of battle all together. The terrifying tunes and calls for battle were answered with thousands of screeches every time, revealing the true magnitude of the force the dwarves were facing. Quick head taker moved across the front line, barking orders and striking at strategic points with a surgical precision, often delivering deadly blows to many dwarves. He moved swiftly with the proficiency of an experienced killer. He moved in and out of combat and left almost no room for proper retaliation the casualties of the proud dwarves were irreplaceable, each warrior fallen being a blow to their force and a further insult to their race. Their dead bodies would often be quickly buried under the dirty paws and filthy corpses of the Skaven, many of them being devoured with their flesh still warm or simply being carried away by the uncountable Skaven, never to be seen again.
Many hours had passed since the first drop of blood tainted the hall floors. More and more Skaven entered the place, and they showed no signs of stopping. The battle seemed to have reached an end. But, despite all of that, the dwarves fought on. Surely by this point, many of them knew this was to be their final stand against such overwhelming odds. The banners of the proud dwarves were down, one by one and their own war horns sounded less and less as time passed. Some of the Dali fought even harder, avenging their painful losses and committing to the heroic last stand. Songs could be heard, and screams of defiance would rise above the chaotic noise. But this was coming to an end. More and more Skaven enter the hall in never-ending lines. The fate of the dwarves was sealed. By the overwhelming weight of numbers were they defeated. Their heads, skulls, and relics would adorn the many banners and twisted totems that the vermin tide would rise up after their victory. We will bring down their decaying empire, and the children of the haunted rat shall inherit the ruins. I will see that it is Clan Wars that emerges preeminent from this extermination. Finish them quickly. Go to help the others. Complete the tasks they will not be able to finish on their own. Clan Wars must look strong. Clan Wars must be victorious. According to many of the great minds and philosophers that have walked the Empire, all men and women have a predestined role to fulfill. This is called predeterminism. In this vision, all who are born with a thirst for knowledge are meant to become mages, inventors, and sages of great wisdom. The physically adept are to be warriors craftsmen, and upholders of the law. And the sharp-minded would be politicians, merchants, and ambassadors. Yet, if humans have built this theory, it is the Under-Empire which has put it into practice to the farthest extent. The legendary fortunes of Clan Mulder are raised by the horrifying and extraordinary biological weapons they provide for the rest of the Skaven clans. It is this specialty that ensured them a place amongst the four strongest clans of their kin. In the constant and deadly race for superiority, warlords pay generously for the ferocious war beasts constructed with the acclaimed Mulder Mastery. Rivals may attempt to duplicate and create their own terrifying rat ogres and giant rats, but their efforts are, in the big majority of cases, all in vain. Ancient secrets of altering experiments, their brutal methods of training and the knowledge of using warpstone as a base material are kept greedily guarded by Clan Mulder, ensuring their power and their supremacy. To the north of the desolated lands of Troll Country, the jagged peaks of the world's edge mountains rise as if to rip holes into the sky. The vast rocks on the mountainside are cracked into crevasses that sink almost as deep as the boiling heart of the world. Somewhere in the bottom of this void and within the northern wastes lies the twisted lair of Clan Mulder. 
named Hell Pit, a place that breathes toxic fumes out like a diseased creature. Rocks as sharp as claws rise from the bottom of the crater, along with crudely constructed towers and buildings. Countless shacks and tents are stapled on one another, rising from the floor of the crevasse along its walls. The overpopulated stronghold is so chaotic and overcrowded that it looks as if the crater waits to puke it all out. Within the laboratories of their loathsome stronghold, the Packmasters use warpstone to play and experiment with their subjects. Bones are bent, flesh is sewn, and chemicals are poured until a violent creature awakens, trapped in a cursed body. Within the minds of that damned place, abounding warpstone shines an unnatural light through the lifeless rocks. Above Hell Pit, fearsome abominations of chaos and numerous wild creatures dwell in the wastelands of the surface world. It is the Skaven of Clan Mulder that thrive with the endless opportunities such resources bring along. The roaming chaos mutants and beasts are captured and used as the base ingredients for the endless trials and experiments. The skilled packmasters need yet to break the primitive will of the massive beasts they capture under whip and chain. Only the most tenacious and vicious remain to be bred further, to be sold or to be added to their own ranks. It is important to note that only the best of their designs are for the clan to keep and use against those who wish to challenge them. There is no restraint in the madness that goes into the creation, for the raw material is plenty, and the imagination of the Skaven is wild. One prime example of such creations are the Rat Ogres. They are the products of the clan's wickedness and expertise in crossbreeding. They are spawned for a sole purpose, that is, to obey their packmasters and gorge their enemies as hugely augmented weapons of war. Although the exact details of their ancestry are not certain, they bear the foul features of both the Skaven and ogres. Just as the Skaven, their feet move at great speed in the tunnels, and they are driven by an ever-present tormenting hunger. Their grotesque and misshapen figures stand as tall as ten feet, towering over the common Skaven like a tree. Rat ogres are barely smarter than a standing rock, but it is not intelligence that their buyers seek. Pumped up with growth-inducing chemicals, humongous muscles cover every bit of the creature. Once a rat ogre is bred, the dazed beast is subjected to callous treatments to enhance its vigor. The master mutators often sew and stitch pieces of flesh and metal as they see fit, and mend it all within a balm derived of warpstone. Following their artificial making, the beasts are sent to the Packmasters to be trained. Although aggressive and feral, the lack of intelligence in a rat ogre makes it a demanding process to train them. They are put to fight with other monsters of the clan to select the best for themselves, classify others for selling, and eliminate the weak samples. In battle, they are a crushing force if a Packmaster can command them skillfully. An uncontrolled rat ogre is disruptive and, without rigorous guidance, it will attack aimlessly or halt to feed on flesh rather than fight. Left without supervision, it is also common to find the beasts attacking each other in mindless duels, getting carried away by their own blind savagery. The doomed creatures are tormented by their own unnatural existence and often attempt to rip off their stitched body parts and even gorge on their own torn flesh. Due to such unreliable behavior, 
Experienced packmasters know that it is best to quickly chain the beasts back once the fighting is over. Master mutators are responsible for the creation of these monstrosities. But there is one master mutator that rises above all others. A twisted and wicked creature that has a reputation that precedes him. Throt is the master mutator of Clan Mulder, and one of the oldest of his breed. Over time, he has extended his life way beyond its natural course, his accomplishments securing him a prestigious place within his clan. Throt's existence profoundly depends on the powers of Warpstone. It is this source of strange energy that he uses to defy the logic of nature in his insane studies. However, of all beings, Throt knows that when raw forces are involved, all deeds come with a great cost. Besides his obsession with producing undefeatable beasts of war, he also seeks to enhance his own powers through the use of Warpstone. It is such experiments that gift him with an unnaturally high energy and a lengthy life far beyond the ordinary. Throt the Unclean, as he is widely known, has an excessive physical strength running through him, yet his blessing with such vigor comes with a curse of maddening hunger. His metabolism works at such an incredible pace that he almost has to eat continually just to ease his hunger. It is a craving so much stronger than the black hunger his brethren suffer from. To avoid being driven to insanity and having his judgment blurred, he carries pouches stuffed with all kinds of foods to gnaw at. Already cruel in nature, Throt is exceptionally brutal at the times of his agonizing hunger. Finally cure the hunger! <laughs> Over the long years of exposure to the Warpstones, Throt's body has been increasingly displaying the marks of mutation. A strong third arm grows from his deformed and grisly frame, as if it had always belonged there. Sharp bones of spine sprout from his neck and run along the back like the ridges of a malformed mountain range. Along with such physical anomalies he exhibits, the unclean sanity dwells at the edge of mania as well. It is safe to say that Throt's rightful reputation comes from his success in creating unthinkable monstrosities through twisted and oftentimes painful procedures and commanding them in battle. He spends countless hours devising the most extravagant mutating tools and techniques. Echoes of frantic screams hailing from his study can often be heard in the dark hallways that surround the working area. Awaiting a wretched fate, all manners of creatures crawl in chains and cages in his laboratory. Deafened to their howls, Throt continues his search for ingredients to better his growing juices and explore the crossbreeds that result in the most gruesome fighters. Amidst this endless pursuit, he sinks ever deeper into a madness that consumes him from the very inside. In Clan Mulder's pursuit of improving their designs into perfection, it is often Throt who comes up with authentic yet bizarre ideas that serve their agendas. One of such ambitions was to forge a variety of rat ogre that was to be perfected beyond its flaws. As common rat ogres lacked complex intelligence, training them as soldiers proved to be challenging and lengthy. Their extremely hostile nature often leads to a hysterical ravaging and makes it difficult to command or control them during battle. Following many failed experiments, Master Moulders seemed to be stuck in a compromise between intelligence and aggression. 
It was Throt who turned up with an ingenious idea to improve their brains without losing the Rat Ogre's ferocity. To realize this mischievous plan, he grew his own Skaven slaves that displayed submissive nature and higher intelligence. Once the slaves were ready, they were bound onto the backs of the Rat Ogres with warpstone embedded harnesses. As the Skaven slowly embedded themselves over time, a new creature was given life by this unholy fusion. To equip his new construction with the most fitting weapons, Throt then sought collaboration with the arrogant Ikit Claw, and together they designed the infamous creature named Stormfeed. They are the ultimate and brutal combination of Clan Molder's bioengineering and Clan Scryer's sadistic techno magic. Hulking behemoths clad in bulletproof metal armor and equipped with massive Gatling cannons or swirling armored gauntlets. Throt is committed to advancing Clan Molder, both through intelligent development and warfare. He marches to battle under the banner of his clan and leads his savage pack of mutants for a feast on the enemy. Throt's weapon of choice is a things catcher named Creature Killer. With this arm-like long device, Throt can grab the necks of even the largest rat ogres with ease and pin them to the ground with unnatural strength. His other hand holds the whip made of minotaur hide that is boiled in troll digestive fluids. The whip of domination strikes onto enemies and slaves with a stinging power and bends them to Throt's will. During one of his many battles, the master's left eye was gouged from its socket by a rival packmaster. To remedy his missing eye, a rough piece of warpstone was ineptly implanted in his empty eye socket. What sort of lunacy and wicked power the stone emits onto his already murky brain remains a baffling mystery. Through the long years of his remarkable life, several failed attempts were made to undermine Throt. Many of his usurpers were met with merciless execution, whether they were of his own blood or not. The Master Mutator is always vigilant of those who may conspire against him, and lives in a constant state of paranoia in his already unstable mind. Throt is a dangerous master, and a vile creature himself, but more so, he is an insane genius and an innovative maker. Along with mastering the ancient techniques of Clan Mulder, Throt incorporates secrets that he learned from other races, creatures, and techniques in his own masterpieces. Many of his designs are inspired by his faraway travels to strange lands such as Lustria, a wild place where giant reptilian creatures roam the lands. During one of his journeys, he allied with Clan Pestilence and learned some of the wicked ways of their feared plague monks. Upon combining his newly gained knowledge in deadly diseases with his own skills in mutation and crossbreeding, the Master Mutator is set to create a deadly weapon. His objective? To breed a modified rat strain that carries a deadly and highly contagious disease to release upon the enemy. Moving on to the units and varieties of specially engineered breeds of mutated beasts, one can find a specialized variant of the Rat Ogres, the Bone Breakers. These are abnormally bulked beasts that can sometimes be up to twice the size of a common Rat Ogre. To construct them, they soak the Rat Ogres in a vat of growth fluids for months. This special chemical mix is produced by excruciating procedures the slaves of Clan Molder go through before finally perishing. Thousands of Skaven slaves are sacrificed to get the needed juices, but the end result is worth it for the clan. Once the transformation of the Rat Ogre is complete, a Bone Breaker is born. A mutated, towering beast that is so heavy in engineered muscle mass that it can't stand upright. 
The Bonebreaker moves with his upper body arched forward, as the enormous muscles cannot resist the gravity. After placing a platform on its hunch, the Bonebreaker is ready to perform as a peculiar steed for its owner. Some of the specimens even carry sharp pieces of metals and warpstone instead of hands, creating drills that can break down stone and wall alike. A Bonebreaker is worth an incredible sum of coin, as it is sold to arrogant warlords who, more than anything, love to flaunt their superiority by riding atop this massive creature. Giant rats are vermin that were exposed to shape-altering practices by master molders. Upon being mutated and exploited, most of their features that resemble natural rats disappear. Although some physical similarities such as hairless feet and tails remain, giant rats share nothing more of their appearance with their cousins. Master molders stop at nothing to create more dangerous and capable predators, so it is a common sight to see all manners of spikes, bone plates, and tusks added onto their creations. Due to the modifications the rats go through, many of these giant vermin carry multiple heads, limbs, and tails. Their sharp teeth poke out from strong jaws, almost like ice spikes. Wild and feral, they gnaw and strip the flesh off the bones effortlessly. When the pack of giant rats charge at the foes at a speedy pace, it is pure horror that takes hold of the heart. Due to their lower cost, they are regularly purchased by warlords who add them to bolster their forces. The most bloated of these giant rats are called brood horrors. These are huge, fast-moving monsters, adept at punching through infantry lines while causing terror throughout the ranks of nearby soldiers. They come into existence when they begin mutating and then feasting on litter and even other rats. They grow extraordinarily fast while increasing in both strength and savagery. The brood horrors can also be used as mounts, and they are highly prized by the Mulder Masters, as they are only traded to the greatest of Warlord clans. For only they have the necessary wealth to get their hands on one of them. When not serving as mounts, these frenzied horrors can be unleashed upon the enemy to break havoc and destruction in their lives. A Hell Pit Abomination is a weirdly engineered creature that neither fully resembles a beast nor a machine. The most despicable and devious fantasies of the clan finds form in this extravagant creature. It is a horrid construction, with all manners of mechanical pieces riveted onto flesh and bone. Metal wheels and spikes perforate the meat chunk as fluid pumps unceasingly push mutating chemicals through its veins just to keep the twisted abomination together. Multiple heads and limbs protrude through the mass, bestowing the creature an even more hellish sight. The grotesque, rat-like heads hiss as the jaws snap aimlessly towards the scent of prey. The colossal abomination creeps forward in the battlefield, making his way by crushing shields and skulls with giant fists. The rival soldiers scatter away, bewildered with the sight of this shocking creature charging upon them. Even if one were to collect his courage and stand to attack, it is yet a quest to slay only one of the beast's raging heads. 
to the horror of the enemy soldiers. A hell pit abomination is even known to regenerate chopped off limbs and even rise from the dead, making it almost impossible to kill. Coming in the form of ravenous monsters are the Wolf Rats. Highly mobile pack beasts which are poisonous and can pierce through armor with their sharp razor claws. They can be found almost everywhere that the Skaven infest. From the tunnels and sewers that run below the towns and cities of other races, in Skaven nest lairs, as well as existing freely in the wild. When summoned to battle, their hunger will send them tearing through the ranks of an enemy unit, their strength being bolstered with warpstone and other weird mutations. I've fought some beasts in my time. Tusker boars, corpse hounds, greenskins. Once I even killed a bear with two heads, out with the hunting party in the Drakwold. But what attacked us in the hills near Helmgart was like nothing me nor the lads had ever seen before. Scrawny things they were, like rats, but, but bigger, bigger than wolves. And just as damn quick. Mykov was the first to go, dragged off his horse when two of the bloodthirsty beasts leapt at him from the trees, either side of the path. Lightold was next, then Grimold, then Bertha, all hamstrung and ripped open, bleeding out, good as dead, before any of us could bear steel. And then, then the woods were alive with the vile things, screeching like razors on glass. So what did I do? Yeah, I, I, I hightailed it out of there, of course. I'm not bloody stupid. Making an appearance as a former general of Archaon the Everchosen is Gorich, who once ignored his commander's orders due to the bloodthirst he felt in his veins. Despite being directly commanded to not attack an Empire artillery train, Gorich, who was a devoted servant of the Blood God, attacked anyway, resulting in his tribe being mostly wiped out. He was later sent to help it as punishment. There, Throt transplanted his brain into the body of a rat ogre, creating an aberration of incredible speed, strength, and intelligence, making the former general one of Throt's most successful creations. Eventually escaping from Throt's laboratory, Gorich scrambled his way up to the arena at the heart of Hell Pit, where he fought off the tide of monsters and weird creations the Master Mutator sent after him. His skills did not go unnoticed by Thrust, who recognized his combination of intellect and strength as perfect for controlling the more rebellious of their troops. Gorich worked his way into the rank of chieftain and has commanded many armies under the banner of Clan Mulder. Hidden out of sight, armies of horrifying mutants and war beasts await until their time is right to cast blight unto their unsuspecting enemies. Quite frankly, only the fools believe that life moves solely on the surface. Only the blind can't see there is more than meets the eye. Beneath the roots of the trees and the visible plains, a world in turmoil lives buried in the Under Empire. Lairs of Skaven are connected by countless winding underground tunnels that spread like gigantic main highways. A large part of this underway was once built in the times of glory of the dwarfs the masters of stone. Such prosperous times are long gone now, and the witness of it all are the rotting tunnels heavily infested with the ratkin 
and the twisted, mutated beasts of Clan Mulder, who will stop at nothing to achieve their malign goals. Warhammer Chaos in Conquest, the ultimate strategy and domination MMO mobile game. Available on iOS and Android. Download it by clicking on the link in the description or by scanning the QR code now and claim special rewards. On this channel, we are putting together narrative Total War cinematic battles and Warhammer lore videos. A special thank you goes to our Patreon supporters who help us in the making of more content. You can also join Patreon and earn extra perks while supporting the videos to come. Find the link in the description below. Make sure to subscribe and thank you for watching. See you on the next one.